Well, good morning all, and welcome to our worship this morning. Uh, and a special welcome to any who are visiting with us this morning, or any others who might be worshipping here for the first time. And a, a warm welcome to Come for Refreshments for Coffee, which are served outside the, the West Hall at our close of worship. Uh, we also have visiting with us today Ali and Chris Burgett. I'm not sure if they're st still hiding through in the rest of the They're percussionists for this morning during the anthem, but a very warm welcome, welcome to them. The, the church notices are all there as, as printed. Uh, we would particularly draw attention to the fact that the, the fish fry has been rescheduled. That's in aid of Bermuda cancer. That's, that's on Thursday. We have a, I had an email, email during the week from David Thompson, who's presently in the, in the Middle East, just saying we hope that to be well supported by members of the congregation and that it will bring along family and, and friends, but they also need help in, in running this event and need uh, around 30 volunteers. The operation begins at three in the afternoon and it finishes when the floor's washed at nine in the evening. So if you're able to come for any of, of that time, uh, please, could you contact Anne Spencer Ascot? So, if you could contact contact her, if you're able to help. And for information, the fish fry dinner is is twenty dollars, which comes complete with the meal, drink, and the dessert. You can take away, or you can dine in the Thorburn Hall, uh, enjoying one of Jill Wash the Noise great desserts. It's a fun family event, and children's meals are available for a reduced price. There you are, kids. So that's on that's on Thursday. Next Sunday is Remembrance Sunday, and so just the one service of worship next Sunday, and that will begin at 10.45, so 10.45 next Sunday, next Sunday morning. I'd also like to say a word of thanks for all those who turned up uh, yesterday for what amounted to a, a spring clean. It was to be a day morning in the church, afternoon in the manse. The afternoon in the manse, it was a bit wet, so th thanks to the small group that gathered there before they were driven away by the rain. For the, work that, uh, for the work that they did, and for all the rest who helped here on what was a fairly comprehensive spring clean of the, of the building. Um, two of our volunteers insist that they found dust that was 300 years old. <laughs> and being of a sentimental nature, they left it there for the anniversary. <laughs> uh, but I hope you see that the place is looking, uh, is looking rather different, and thanks to, thanks to, to Ross Anderson, because it was Ross that did all the phoning round. Uh, to get people to come along as, as volunteers. Uh, and finally, we didn't, because of the weather, we didn't get the truck loaded, which is presently sitting in the man's garden. If anyone's able to give about half an hour at one o'clock this afternoon just to load it up, uh, Malcolm will be there, speak to, speak to Malcolm, uh, and that would, be, that would be much appreciated. I think these are all our, all our notices. Um, Monday of, of last week, 1st of November, is All Saints Day. So generally uh, recognized on the first Sunday of the month, so that's, that's today. So that's our theme for worship today, All, All Saints Day. So in that respect, a, a slightly different service, but I hope one that you'll, that you'll appreciate. And so let us worship God and singing to his praise hymn 111, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty, hymn 111.
They will be called the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. Let us pray. Almighty God, we gather this day to offer you our worship and our praise. As we gather on this All Saints Sunday, we acknowledge that we come together with your whole church in heaven and on earth to acknowledge you as creator and sustainer of all that is. The God who in love has created and continues to create, and the God who in love sustains us. Sustains us through the example of Christ, for his life of faithful obedience to your ways, and who sustains us through the guidance and the promptings of your Holy Spirit, at times seeking to comfort and console, at times seeking to challenge us to better live in your ways, the ways of truth and of life. For we confess we do not always do so. Rather than the selfless and obedient example of Christ, which we seek to follow, we are motivated instead by selfishness and self-centeredness. And so do harm to ourselves, harm to others, harm <coughs> to the very creation of which we are a part. Our relationships with others are not all they should be, and our relationship with the earth, one where at times we poison the very seas and oceans that surround us, and we pollute the air that we breathe. O gracious God, before you now we ask forgiveness, as we ask also the forgiveness of those whom we have wronged or let down. Grant us, we pray, the assurance of that forgiveness, that we might be freed from these faults and failings, and indeed guilt of the past. Help us this day to look again on the inspiration of the prophets of old, the saints of the church, and above all, the life of Christ, that we may follow him more faithfully, growing closer to you and so closer to one another. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you the Father and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Boys and girls, would you like to come down to the, to the front? Thank you. Now, boys and girls, as I said in the introduction, this is again a special day in the life of the church when we remember what are called the saints of the church. And the saints of the church were men and women, male and female, who lived very special lives in the way that they followed the teaching of, the teaching of, of Jesus. And some of these saints we know by name, and some of them we don't know their names. But today is a day where we give thanks for their lives and for their example. Now, I was going to see how you are on saints. Do any of you know any of the names of the saints? Now, I guess you might do, because you've got two islands here in Bermuda that are named after two of them. What have we got at the, up at the east end of the island? What's the parish up at the east end? And what's the one that the airport's on? Who can tell me? I'm sure you must know. Yes. St. George's, St. George's Island, that's right. Well, it's after, named after St. George, who was, the, who was the patron saint, he was called the patron saint of England, as well as other countries, because many countries have a special saint just for them, which they call the patron saint. And St. George is a patron saint of England. Now, what's the island that the, what's the, island that the airport's on? Not St. George's. What's next to St. George's? Who can tell me? Who can tell me? Yes, St. David's, well done, St. David's. And St. David is the patron saint of Wales. Okay, so he's very special to the Welsh people. The patron saint of Scotland, who's that? Can anyone tell me? Can anyone tell me who the patron saint of Scotland is? Yeah. Well, he's called St. Andrew. St. Andrew's got a town named after him, right? St. Andrew. And the patron saint of Ireland? Who can tell me who that might be? Patron Saints of Ireland. He's got a hymn named after, yes. St. Patrick, well done, St. Patrick. Now a tough one. Who's the patron saint of Bermuda? 
Hey, who's the patron saint of Bermuda? Any of you know? I'm not surprised you don't know because you don't have one. You don't have one. I'm not sure what that tells us about Bermuda, but you don't, you don't have a patron, a patron saint. And you know what I think that means? That means we've got to do what the saints did and live the way that Jesus taught, and we'll have to be, all of us, young and old, the saints, the saints on Bermuda. A very special saint, one of the most famous, one of my favorite, was a man called Francis, St. Francis of Assisi, and he's the patron saint of Italy. Italy. And when he was growing up, he was really quite a, a wealthy young man. His father had a business selling lovely cloths and silk, and he had a great time with his friends, and he partied a lot, and he played a lot, and then suddenly he kind of had, a, he had a, a change, and he saw a man, he saw a man begging in the streets one day, and he was busy at the time. He was busy selling his father's silk and cloth, right? And when he had finished his business, he was so upset by what he'd seen about this man begging that he went and chased after him when he'd sold all his cloth and finished his business, and he took all the money that he'd got for the cloth, and he gave it to this poor man who was begging. Well, his dad wasn't too pleased, right? His dad wasn't too pleased, but Francis didn't care. He came to be known as Francis. He was actually born Giovanni, but his dad was in France at the time, and when he came back, he decided he was going to call him Francesco, right? So, Francis. And he decided that he would live a life following, as closely as he could, the teaching of Jesus. And it's often said that he was probably the one man who got closest to following the teaching of Jesus. He was always working amongst the poor. He didn't want anything for himself. He lived a life, a kind of a, a poor life amongst his, amongst his friends. And he was a great example. And he did something else that's very special and that you can be thinking about next month. What's next month? Yeah. December, Christmas. Christmas next month. Okay. And very often at Christmas, do you have a kind of nativity play in a nativity scene? Well, way back, 800 years ago almost, yeah, 800 years ago, St. Francis created the first nativity scene, right? So that's how old it is. He created the first nativity scene. And he did something that we probably won't do in church because he used a real live donkey, right, and, and a real, real live ox, and he had a kind of a manger with a straw in it, and that was to show people, try and remind people about the manger at, at Bethlehem. So when we have our nativity scene, our nativity play here in church at Christmas time, we can think of this most famous of saints, St. Francis. And we can also remember that because you don't have a patron saint, a special saint here in Bermuda, down to all of us. Okay? We're going to sing the children's hymn now. When we do that, today's also Spaghetti Sunday. So if any of you have got spaghetti or pasta out there, you can lift it up and the children will come and they'll come and, and collect it. And the hymn we're going to sing is 755. 755. Be still and know that I am God. 755.
remain standing for the blessing upon the children. Well, loving God, as our children go from here, may they go with your blessing and so know your peace and your joy. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Hear the word of God proclaimed in the uh, Old Testament, the book of Daniel, chapter 7, verses 1 to 3, followed by verses 15 to 18. You can find this on page 828 in the Old Testament of the Bible in the pew. Page 828, Daniel, chapter 7, beginning with the first verse. In the first year of King Belshazzar of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head as he lay down in bed. Then he wrote down the dream. I, Daniel, saw in my vision by night the four winds of heaven, stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts came up out of the sea, different from one another. And at verse 15, As for me, Daniel... My spirit was troubled within me, and the visions of my head terrified me. I approached one of the attendants to ask him the truth concerning all of this. So he said he would disclose to me the interpretation of the matter. As for these four great beasts, four kings shall arise out of the earth, but the holy ones of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever and ever. The anthem is Upon This Rock. Upon 
on this rock, I'll build my church. Upon this rock, I'll build my kingdom on this earth. I'll build my church. Upon this rock, this solid rock, I'll build my church. Upon this rock, you are the Christ, the Son. Today's gospel comes from the gospel of St. Luke. It's St. Luke's version of the Matthew's teaching of the Beatitudes. And it's St. Luke chapter 6 and at verse 20. Then Jesus looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven. For that is what their ancestors did to the prophets." But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. But I say to you that listen, love your enemies do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. May God bless to us the reading of his holy word, and to his name be the praise and the glory. Amen. Hymn 462. The King of love, my shepherd is, whose goodness faileth never. Hymn 462.
May the words of my lips and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our Lord and our Redeemer. Amen. All Saints Sunday, and see the traditional, one of the traditional readings, so that's perhaps rather strange reading from the, the book of Daniel, a book which was written in the first half of the second century BC at the time of, of persecution of the Jewish people when their country was being largely Hellenized by, by Greek culture and they found themselves, as I say, uh, somewhat, somewhat oppressed. It's an unusual reading. I'll just touch on it briefly. That opening that opening verse or two. I, Daniel, saw in my vision by night the four winds of heaven stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts came up out of the sea, different from one another. And he then goes on to describe in rather terrifying fashion the, the four beasts. And the four beasts are, in fact, nothing else than some of the great empires of history that during the history of Israel had oppressed that people and, and invaded them, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, these great empires which are characterized as the, as the four beasts and the four kings that will arise. And for our purposes today, the, the important part of that passage is the, is the last verse that, that was read. When he talks again of the, the great beasts and the four kings that shall arise out of the earth, but then writes, but the holy ones of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever and ever. The holy ones of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever and ever. The holy ones, or as it's translated in other versions, the, the saints. And so it's All Saints Day that we'll reflect on today, but before doing that, to take you, take you back a bit, um, Yesterday, as I said, we had, the, we had the great sort of clean-up followed by a kind of a Guy Fawkes dinner. And again, thanks to all those who contributed and, and helped with that. And uh, Liz Parker had said to me, well, at the dinner, you can tell the children the story of Guy Fawkes. And I said, well, that's great, Liz. I mean, he tried to blow up the Houses of Parliament. We can maybe, we can maybe cope with that bit of it. And he had, you know about anything up to 20, 30, 60 barrels of gunpowder, so that's quite exciting for them. Um, and they did catch him in time, so that was fortunate. But then the story gets tricky, because he was arrested, tried, and hung, drawn, and quartered. And this does not make a good children's story. So we had to kind of abbreviate it a bit and just stop at the stage where he got, he got caught. And, and so teach them the rhyme, remember, remember, the 5th of November. And there's a lot that we kind of mark in our church and in our society that's really not great for children. And so I, I take you back again um, to last week and to Halloween. Um, very popular in, in, in North America. I was astounded to learn from our daughter who lives in Canada just outside Vancouver. They had 400 children around the door. 400 children on the estate that they live in, and their young grandson came on Skype and said, look at the bag of candies I've got, <laughs> which should probably do them for the, for the rest of the year. And so off children go on Halloween with their, with their lanterns and their trick and treating. And have they any idea of the origins of, of, of that practice? Because the origins really come from the, the mists of, of time. And again, probably a story is not terribly suitable for children. Let's start with the lanterns. How many of you know the story of Jack-o'-lantern? Right, Jack-o'-lantern. Jack-o'-lantern, it's an Irish folk tale. And Jack-o'-lantern was a bit of a rascal. He was a bit of a character. He spent more times in pubs and bars than he should have done and didn't always behave as he should. And one night he was on his way home from the bar when he encountered the devil. And they had an interesting conversation, but he managed to trick the devil into climbing an apple tree. And as soon as the devil was up on the apple tree, Jack carved a cross on the trunk of the tree so the devil couldn't get back down. So then the bargaining began. And the bargain was that when Jack eventually died, the devil would not accept him into hell. And so an agreement was made and the devil was released from the, from the tree. And Jack continued on in his dissolute ways until his death. Because at his death, 
Because of his lifestyle, he wasn't received into heaven. But neither could he be received into hell because of the bargain that he'd made with the devil. So the devil took a, a, a coal, a live burning coal, and he threw it to Jack. And Jack caught it, and he hollowed out a lantern and put it in the lantern as a light to help him in his wanderings to this day and hope that one day he might find a resting place. So there you are. So off the children go with their lanterns, and that's the story. Jacko, Jacko Lantern. And of course, the other thing about this All Saints Day is that, again, back in the mist of time, it had its origins in a Celtic festival called Samhain. Samhain. And that was at the end of the summertime, if you like, in the beginning of winter. It was a time when hopefully all the crops indeed were in, but also the, the livestock would be taken in from the fields and taken in to be sheltered for the, for the winter. And a time when the people hoped that they would get through the, the harsh winter that would be, befall them in these, in these Celtic lands. And Samhain was a, very, was a very special night, this night, the 1st of November. It was a night when it was felt that there was an ever greater closeness between this world and, other, and the other world and otherworldly things. And so it was a night when the Ishis were at loose. And the Ishis were elves or, or fairies or spirits from the other world who could enter into our world on this special night, the night of, of Samhain. And the other thing that would happen on that night, and this was celebrated up until about the, the 18th, 19th century in parts of Ireland, it was a night in which the souls of the dead returned to their homes. On this one night, the souls of the dead returned to their homes. And so many people would set a place at table for them or they would leave food by the fire for this, say, special, special evening. And the trick-or-treating, or as it's known in Scotland, as I said to the children last week, guising, when they dress up in disguise, adults would do that to try and take the place of the ishis, the fairies or the elves, or indeed the souls of the dead as a kind of form of protection. And they would go around and they would collect food for them and leave it out. In a, in a safe place. So that's, that's Samhain. That's its, that's its origins. And over time, it was taken over by the church and, and became All Saints Day. But the important thing about it was that it was seen as this, as this day when the, the separation, if you like, in Samhain's time between this world and the other world and the church's reinterpretation of it between earth and heaven was as thin as might be. And George MacLeod, former moderator of the Church of Scotland and founder of the Iona community, he was instrumental in, in building, rebuilding Iona Abbey. George MacLeod always felt that Iona was a very special place where that, that layer was thin as could be. And he always talked about the layer between heaven and earth on Iona uh, being a veil as thin as gossamer a veil as thin as gossamer. And that's something, in a sense, that we reflect upon on All Saints' Day. Because it moved away from the traditions of Samhain um, and Ishis to become a day when the saints were remembered. And in the early days of the church, as people, great church people, became martyred and became saints, then they were given a special day. But as the years passed and the centuries passed, there were too many martyrs for them actually to be given their own particular day. And so a, a special day was set aside as, as All Saints Day. And it moved around a bit. But it was eventually in the, in the eighth century under Pope Gregory that it was decided that it should be the 1st of November. And so many churches celebrate or recognize it on the 1st of November or on the Sunday which follows. Now come the Reformation, the reformers weren't too keen on the notion of saints because within the, within the Roman Catholic Church one could pray to the saints and expect them to perform miracles on one's behalf and intercede on one's behalf in cases of illness or sadness or whatever. So gradually, uh, following the Reformation in the different churches of the Reformation, the, the Protestant churches, it became not so much an All Saints Day, but a day on which to give thanks for all who were departed this life and who had lived lives of faith 
and who were dear to us by the example they had given or the love that had been shown to us. So it broadened out from just being the, just being the saints to all those who have gone before us in this earthly life, but especially those who have been dear to us. And some of the Lutheran churches for Sweden, Sweden, for example, on All Saints Day at worship, they will read out the lives of those who have died during the course of the year, and a candle will be, will be lit, and they'll be especially remembered on that day. So the notion of saints became expanded, not just those whose names were recorded, the St. George's, the St. Andrew's, the Francis of Assisi, and so on, but, but others as well whose names are, are never recorded. And in that vein, I would close with, with uh, this reflection. Um, I received just recently uh, from, through David Thompson, uh, an email from Billy Bakosi in Malawi. And some of you will be aware, but others might not be, that Billy is a, is a medical student. He's studying in Malawi in the Faculty of Health at the university there, and was in danger of having to give up his studies and his course because of, because of lack of finances. And members of the church through Bermuda Overseas Mission and directly have helped out to ensure that Billy's fees have again have been paid for this year. And this was a, this was a message uh, from Billy expressing his appreciation of the support that he says that you are giving and doing in my life. It is very special and wonderful that he is he's receiving this. And he makes his commitment to continue his training and to study hard and eventually become a doctor in Malawi and, and practice there, which is very, very important. It is now something required by the Malawian government, because I think, as I may have mentioned to some of you before, there are more Malawian doctors in Manchester than there are in Malawi. Um, many in completing their training come and, and earn elsewhere, but, but Billy uh, is committed to continuing his studies and qualifying as a doctor and practicing in Malawi, and he he thanks the people of Christ Church for that. And what came to mind when I read this was an email I had previously received when in Melrose, in Bowden and Melrose, from the congregation that we supported there and some of their work. And the reason it came to mind is it began thus, to the saints of Bowden and Melrose. Right, that's how it began. Now, I don't think the congregation really thought of themselves as saints. I'm not sure I thought of them as saints, but that's another matter. But that's how it began, to the saints of Bowden and Melrose. So on this All Saints Day, we could say, well, to the saints of Christ Church, just ordinary men and women, like who throughout history, and whose names are not recorded, but have tried to live lives of faith and follow Christ's example. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We sing in hymn 742, Rejoice in God's saints today and all days, hymn 742.
different style in our prayer of thanksgiving and intercession for, for today, um, all, all Saints Day. I mentioned in my sermon George MacLeod. George MacLeod was a fascinating and intriguing character. Uh, as a youngster, he went to public or private school in, in the UK. He was very much an anti-establishment figure who ended up in the House of Lords. Um, he founded the Iona community uh, and was largely responsible for the rebuilding of the abbey there, which was done by a combination of men out of work following the Depression and trainee ministers and ministers who would labor to the tradesmen who had the, who had the skills in the rebuilding of the abbey. But one of his, also one of his great skills was his command of language. And he wrote some beautiful prayers. And it's one I would just simply like to share with you as our prayer of, of thanksgiving this, this morning. And as I referred to in my, my sermon, the prayer is simply called, A Veil Thin as Gossamer. And it's, it's written in the traditional language that George would have used in his conduct of worship. Let us, let us pray. Be thou, O God, in the midst of us, as we give thanks for those who have gone from the sight of earthly eyes. They, in thy nearer presence, still worship with us in the mystery of the one family in heaven and on earth. We remember those whom thou didst call to high office, as the world counts high. They bore the agony of great decisions and labored to fashion the world nearer to thy design. We remember those who, little recognized in the sight of men and women, bore the burden of the unrecorded day. They served serene because they knew thou hadst made them priests and kings and now shine as the stars forever. If it be thy holy will, tell them how we love them, and how we miss them, and how we long for the day when we shall meet them again. God of all comfort, we lift into thine immediate care those recently bereaved, who sometimes in the night time cry, would God it were morning, and in the morning cry, would God it were night. Bereft of their dear ones, too often they are bereft also of the familiar scenes where happiness once reigned. Lift from their eyes the too distant vision of the resurrection at the last day. Alert them to hear the voice of Jesus saying, I am resurrection and I am life, that they may know and believe this. Strengthen them to go on in loving service of all thy children. Thus shall they have communion with thee, and in thee with their beloved. Thus shall they come to know in themselves that there is no death, and that only a veil divides, thin as gossamer. Amen. We continue our worship with the giving of our offering.
Let us pray. Almighty God, in your name we dedicate this, our offering, praying that it may be a symbol of our commitment to live in your ways and to work for the signs of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray together now and say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I should have mentioned too that following our worship this morning, there is a celebration of, of communion for those who wish to, to attend. Our closing hymn is hymn 740. It's a big sing because it's got eight verses, so we won't sing all of them. We'll sing verses 1, verse 4, and then verses 6 and 8. Verse 1, verse 4, and then verses 6 to 8 of hymn 740, for all the saints who from their labors rest. Now go in peace, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and all whom you love this day and always. <laughs>